Hello and welcome to Guiding Assets, the flagship investment podcast for CFA Institute. I'm Mike Wahlberg and I'm very excited to have Peter Zion on the show today. A regular commentator and speaker and past guest of Take 15, Peter will be known to many of you and his unique brand of seemingly bottomless knowledge paired with irreverence and wit means you will also likely remember him. An author of several books, to quote his bio, Peter is a geopolitical strategist which is a fancy way of saying he helps people understand how the world works. He combines an expert understanding of demography, economics, energy, politics, technology, and security to help clients best prepare for an uncertain future. Welcome to the show, Peter. It's great to be back. Now, I'd like to focus our conversation today, Peter, on your most recent book, which is titled, maybe somewhat ominously, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, Mapping the Collapse of Globalization. It's a broad remit, and working within the 25-minute constraints of our format will be a challenge today, but I'm excited to try. I propose that we take human history in chunks and start with the first few thousand years. So in your book, you describe the concept of geographies of success and how three or four factors have really helped shape global politics and regional economies through the millennia. I'm skipping some steps here, but you start with Egypt as an example, then the big imperial nations of the 15th to 19th century and final t- centuries, and finally the rise of the U.S. Can you start us off maybe by explaining this concept of geographies of success and maybe get us through World War II? Sure. So it, it largely matters how easy it is to move things around in your system versus other systems being able to reach in to get yours. And the reason I started with Egypt, and it wasn't just because it was the first civilization, but sedentary agriculture was something that required a lot of labor and a concentrated footprint with a good hydrological system, but yet physically separated from everyone else. Because if everyone was doing slave labor to grow food, they were not engaging in national defense. And that technological suite of sedentary agriculture lasted more or less until we get to the industrial era, And then things changed. Then it was all about capital generation because we all had to build bridges and roads and forge steel. And the best way to reliably get income was to move things around in your own system via a waterway uh, because moving things on water is about one-tenth the cost of moving them on land, but having sufficient sea access that you can go and interface with other cultures to sell your goods. That lasted up until the current day to a certain degree. But when we got to World War II and its end, the Americans changed the rules of the game. We found ourselves facing off against the Soviets, and we knew that in a battle of numbers we would lose. We were a continent away, an ocean away from where we needed to be. So we needed partners who were willing to die in the trenches, so to speak, as cannon fodder until we could get into play. And that meant we needed an alliance. And we decided the most expedient way to do that was to buy it. So we used our Navy to patrol the global oceans so that everyone could access any part of the international world without having to have a military themselves. And that enabled everyone to trade for the first time without restriction. And that generated the globalized, internationally wired, free trade world that we know. And then on the flip side of that coin, obviously you had the Soviet Union, which is really a command drip, went, drove into command drip and communism as a reaction to that sort of global order that, that was established. Well, they were the target. So they were not able to access the international system in the same way we, that we did. And luckily they were not ideologically geared to try to compete in that space. Had they been, it might've turned out a little bit different. So we come out of the second world war and we've got this new sort of world order that you, where you've got the global security of the U providing that kind of security blanket for the rest of the world to begin trade. And I guess the other sort of major factor of those at play there was of course demographics. So can you talk a bit about how those two in conjunction have kind of given us the last 70 years? Well, in many ways, there are two sides of the same coin, globalization and demographics. So in the world before World War II, if you did not have oil and steel or oil and iron ore and coal and food, the chances were that you were a colony because you certainly didn't have the strength to challenge an empire. But with globalization, you only needed one of the four and you could trade for the other three. And so we all started industrializing. We all started urbanizing from the different starting points and at different paces, but we all started down the same path. You fast forward that a while and it changes how national economics work. Because when you live on a subsistence farm, kids are free labor, you have a whole bunch of them. 
But when you live in town with an industrial job, you're probably living in a condo and then kids are really expensive habits and adults aren't stupid. So we had fewer of them. You play that forward 75 years and we've had a massive demographic shift in the wider world. It started out when a lot of these countries had a lot of people that were young in their 20s and their 30s back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And that generated all the labor you could have possibly wanted and all the consumption you could have wanted. But they kept aging. Nobody was having kids. And by the time you got to the 2000s and the 2010s, we had a lot of cultures that had a lot of people in their late 40s to early 60s so were, were rich, but there wasn't anyone to consume the stuff they pr produced, so they had to export it. What's happening this decade is a lot of countries are moving from that mature worker phase to, to mass retirement. And we don't have an economic model for what happens when you don't have workers of any age or consumers of any age. And so we know that the German system, the Chinese system, the Korean system, the Italian system, the Japanese system is going to end as we understand it this, this decade. And with globalization breaking down because of the failure of demographics, the only reason it might survive is if you get a large country with a huge Navy and a lot of 20, 30 somethings to share everything with everyone. And that would have to be the United States. But we now have had three presidents in a row that have gotten progressively more nationalistic and populist in economic matters with Biden being the most populist economic leader we have ever had and betting that Biden or Trump or someone like either of them will continue to choose to sublimate American economic success in order to preserve the Chinese system, that's a bit of a reach. I guess in the current environment, I mean, it's obviously exacerbated by all of the other factors that have given us inflation with a capital I in current times. Sure. Obviously, this I have to imagine that this isolationist stance can only exacerbate that. Absolutely. I would argue that the majority of the inflation we're experiencing right now is actually rooted in the labor situation. The, the baby boomers, which are the largest cadre, just not in the United States, but globally, are all retiring. On average, they retire actually before the end of the year. So we are well past the peak. We're on the downward slope now. And that means we have lost not just the capacity to produce goods in mass, but also to generate the capital that's necessary to keep the entire system running, whether that's for credit card debt or borrowing to build an aircraft carrier battle group. Uh, the cost of capital everywhere is going up pretty sharply right now. This is not a one-off. This is not the Federal Reserve. This is demographic. This is people moving into retirement and taking their capital with them, liquidating their stocks and bond portfolios and going into much more conservative, low-risk things like T-bills and cash. This was always going to happen. Now it is happening. So we have a capital crunch, a consumption crunch, and a production crunch all at the same time. On top of that is the political impulse for greater control over our own economic destinies. You can call it mercantilist, you can call it nationalist or populist, it really doesn't matter. We're all looking at different interpretations of the same thing. What it is, is popular. The Biden administration is in the process of firing the starting gun, if you will, on doubling the size of the American industrial plant, because we're going to need that in a world where China and Germany cannot function in the way we've become used to it. But yes, that means that in our constrained labor environment, we have to employ a lot more people. And that means that inflation has nowhere to go but up for a very long period of time, at least five years. So one of the release valves for that demographic challenge is immigration, sure. um, which of course is, you know, not not always in, in tune with, with the politically where, where, where the parties want to go there. So what about immigration as a substitute for birth rate? Like, is that a way that we can get around? Maybe we have a few pro-immigration nations around the world that, that could sort of create a younger workforce just through policy? In the mid to long term, that is absolutely true. But in the short term, it's not possible. So two things here. Number one, our single largest source of migration for the last 50 years has been Mexico. But Mexico started down the road towards industrialization and urbanization, just like everybody else. They just started later. They started uh, in the early 90s. Well, the early 90s was 30 years ago, which means that Mexico's birth rate halved about 25 years ago and never recovered. So net migration from Mexico to the United States has actually been negative for 12 of the last 13 years, and I doubt it's ever going to recover. So our normal one-stop shop is gone. That means we have to go to the Eastern Hemisphere and recruit. 
And that means we need a conscious, congressionally mandated immigration policy because we can't just pretend that there's no immigration and leave the southern border open. People actually have to get here from a different hemisphere. The problem we're facing right now is we're also going through a political transition in the United States. Every generation or so, we have enough accrued changes to our system, either through changes in culture or technology or geopolitics, that the factions that make up our parties move around. Uh, the last big time it went down, it was in the 1930s. We had the Great Depression, we had World War II. And before that transition, big business were all Democrats and African Americans were all Republicans. They switched. What's going on today is we're in a tug of war between the Democrats and the Republicans over who gets organized labor. And the issue that organized labor cares about the most is immigration. So no one at the national level from either party wants to touch migration whatsoever until our internal political placement is settled. That's not going to happen in the next year or two. We're probably looking at having to wait until the next presidential election, not 2024, 2028. So we are missing a wonderful opportunity right now while all of the world is in flux and people are looking for a place to land and it's just not going to be here for a bit yet. So on that, do you have any concerns about the future of democracy in the U.S. and, and really around the world? We've seen a lot of sort of populist success. Some some have come in and come out again. Obviously, we saw Brazil go left to center in the last election, but any thoughts on that? For the United States, I'm not overly concerned. We go through these phases, like I said, every generation or two. And part of the reason why it seems so dire is that the parties themselves are breaking down. And this has happened six times before. We will get through this. It's just that it's a five to 10 year process and we're like year six of it right now. So unfortunately we have still have some time to go and you add in social media and we're all screaming at one another. And with Elon taking over Twitter, what content moderation there was is now gone. And I think everybody has noticed that in their own feeds, a lot of the crazy is back, which is very unfortunate in my opinion. But we will get through this. Why do I think we will get through this? Because we had eight years of a failed presidency under Obama and we got through it. We had four years of a failed presidency under Trump and we got through it. Now we have Biden who, lots of people have lots of opinions. I don't think he's anyone's favorite. But compared to the last two people, he's great because he's actually trying to be president. You might not like his policies, but he actually shows up to work and talks to people, which is something the last two didn't do. So I would actually argue that we were well on our way to coming out. And if you look at the midterms, the American preference for rotating and for not liking extremism came through loud and clear. Doesn't mean you have to like where we are. Doesn't mean to like you have to like where we've been or where we're going. But this is what American democracy feels like. This is normal. The rest of the world is the rest of the world. If we really do experience a breakdown in global trade, there are a lot of countries out there that are going to be facing things that are an order of magnitude worse than what we went through with subprime or the Great Recession. And the challenges to democracy in that environment are extreme. I would argue that the country I am most concerned about is Germany. Because of the Ukraine war, they have lost access to Russian natural gas, which provided them, in terms of their gross consumption, 40% of the total. And even though they've been able to replace the gas, it's an inelastic market. So natural gas prices in Germany are now six times what they were before the war. And Germany is not like the United States. We're, we're, we like to talk a good talk about how we want energy independence, but we really don't care. So we'll take it from Canada or Mexico or Saudi Arabia. We'll make some ourselves. So if we don't think anyone's looking, we'll take some from Venezuela. But the Germans can't do that. They're in a more difficult neighborhood. And precision manufacturing requires reliability. So they work with large state-owned companies that export on fixed contracts through fixed infrastructure. And when that broke down, it didn't just interrupt their natural gas supplies. Those natural gas supplies also provide their electricity, and they also provide the inputs for their petrochemical sector. And the petrochemical output is not exported. It's kept in-house to undergird the entire manufacturing sector. So the entire German manufacturing model has basically collapsed. All non-ferrous metal processing has gone away. All fertilizer processing has gone away. We're already seeing automotive down by a third with any, without any change in demand globally. We are probably going to be looking at the end of the German manufacturing model in less than two years. What 
does Germany have going for it if it doesn't have energy, food, or manufacturing? This is a very different world unless you know your German history, in which case this is a very familiar song. And when the Germans feel stressed economically, things spin out of control in a very short period of time and no one cares who votes for who. Hey. So is there a positive cone of, of potential outcomes circling the drain within two years? I know <laughs> I know in your book, you, you did a good job of kind of mapping out how different parts of the world had progressed. They'd industrialized at different points in time. Some of them are going to sort of move through their peak demographic, the bulge and the python, so to speak, a little bit later than the developed world. What's the runway look like for all of this? Well, one of the big effects of globalization was it made countries, local geographies really not matter. The Americans took care of economic security and physical security. And if they do that, then you can do pretty much whatever you want. And this has enabled countries like Germany and Korea to do very well for the last 75 years. If the Americans step back, if geography matters again, if demographics are still in flux and declining, it's not a great picture overall, certainly not on average, but there are plenty of places where the geography is actually really good and there are some places where the demographics are just fine. And those places freed of the competition from those places that have basically been subsidized by the American strategic order. They're going to do great. So, you know, I'm a big fan of the United States. We've got the best demography in the rich world. We've got ocean moats. We've got a great partner in Mexico that is not just proximate, but demographically robust. I can see any number of economic sectors in the North American space doing great. I think we're going to double the size of our industrial plant over the next five years. I see our presence in food and agricultural markets exploding uh, because we're going to be some of the very few positions in the planet that can actually maintain or even expand output. In the European space, watch the Scandinavians. They are not, for the most part, integrated with continental Europe, certainly not with the Germans. They've got their own energy supplies from the North Sea, and they've got excellent relations, not just with the Brits, but with the Americans as well. So I can see in some way a degree of economic association that could work for them very, very well, especially if Russia loses this war. In terms of East Asia, look to Japan, not because it has a great geography or for economic development that doesn't, or a good demography, it's the oldest in the world, but the Japanese saw the writing on the wall and they realized that their demographics were terminal and they realized that economically, if they couldn't part with, with the United States, it wasn't even worth trying. So they got a humiliating trade deal with the Trump administration. And then when the Biden administration came in, they communicated that they have no desire to change the terms. They have found a way to get along with both sides of the American political aisle in the midst of our transition. That is a big achievement, and they managed to pull it off. So they're now part of the friends and family network and kind of piggyback on the strengths of North America. Southeast Asia looks great to me. They're going to pick up a lot of the manufacturing that the Chinese and Europeans are going to drop. And they're young enough demographically that they're going to be a powerful pull of consumption all by themselves. So don't think of this as the end of everything. Think of this as the end of a chapter. We're moving into a new era where the rules have shifted and what makes up a geography of success is going to look a lot more familiar to what it did before 1945 than in this artificial period from 1945 to 2020. Is there anything we can learn from Japan's desourcing strategy when they saw their demographic collapse and went to went to desourcing, set up plants, two other plants, and then through the U.S. and elsewhere? Or is it just too late for that? There are some countries that might, emphasis on the word, might be able to pull it off. The, the advantage that the Japanese had is they started this back in the mid-1990s. They realized as early as 1985 that their demographics were terminal, which incidentally is about the same time they turned terminal in Germany. And they started working on things to make it better. So that is automation, that is outsourcing or desourcing or whichever sourcing you want to call it. Uh, making sure that other countries with better demographics, with consumption bases, have a vested interest in the success of Japanese companies. And they did it at scale. But it took them 30 years. What we're going to be seeing over the next five years is companies coming to this very late to the game. And it'll probably be a corporate-driven strategy as firms are desperate to get exposure to consumption bases. 
as opposed to a state driven strategy like it was in Japan, where it was about national survival. And that's a very different list of countries. So to a degree, I can see the Brits and the Dutch pulling that off, but that's a really small carry. Those aren't huge countries. And the Brits actually have a pretty healthy demography by European standards already. Germany can't do this. It's too late. And there are more people in Germany in their 60s than their 50s than their 40s than their 30s than their teens and children. So the scale of displacement that would have to happen is beyond the capacity of Germany to finance and it would destroy the German employment base anyway, but they're going to try. BASF is probably the, the best current example. They're in the process of literally dismantling their chemical facilities in Germany and shipping them over to Louisiana in a desperate attempt to generate enough petrochemical outcomes that they can then export those outcomes back to Germany to try to, try to save the country's development model. But that would require a build out that would be faster in the next two years in Louisiana than what the Nazis did at the height of World War II. So color me skeptical. So how does your framework of geographies of success and this failing globalization underpin Russia's motivations and possible end game with Ukraine? Oh, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. So two things. Number one, geography. The Russian internal territories are a big flat wide open. And the only way that the Russians have ever discovered that they can actually secure their borders is to forward position in some geographic access points between a few natural barriers. So for example, between the Baltic Sea and the Carpathians, you have the Polish Gap, which is about a 150 mile wide access point. Try to get a military footprint in that gap. Same in Bessarabia, same in the Caucasus and so on. So that's, that's the why this war was always going to happen. In fact, it's already happened several times. The second question is timing. And the Russian ethnicity is flat out dying out. And if they didn't act this year, I would argue that the Russian military would have not had enough 20-something Russian men to draft to even attempt the war in the future. So it always had to happen. It probably always happened. It had to happen right now. So I, I want to ask you about where you put your money. But before I get there, <laughs> in this in this environment, let, we're getting to that. But I actually I have a question that's basically cocktail party fodder that I have and reading and analysis. And I just, I can't seem to come up with come across anybody who's can give me a straightforward answer on on where all the KFC workers have gone. What what how did that labor shortage pinch such in such a way that folks in uh, entry level positions surely they're not all off in school and graphic designers now. Like what actually where, they where, are where did all those people <laughs> Is that, is that the answer? Well, we've got three yeah. things going on. Uh, first of all, the baby boomers are retiring, and they are the largest worker cadre we've ever had. And they, are, the new generation that is coming in, Gen Z, is significantly smaller. So number one, we're losing our largest generation ever. Number two, their replacement generation is our smallest generation ever. So this calendar year, that's a shortage of 400,000 workers. And that is disproportionately concentrated in the very high end that the boomers dominated and the very low end that usually people age 16 to 24 dominate. That's where the gut is happening. And so that's why you're feeling the pressure at KFC. And then there's the third piece. We are in the midst of the greatest reindustrialization period in American history. And Mexico is in the midst of its greatest industrialization period in its history all at the same time. So there's fewer workers available. The exposure is most heavily into that area. And the competition for people at the entry level has never been this fierce anywhere in North America in any age. All that at the same time, you have to use the kiosk. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I actually wanted to circle back to something you, you said in a, few, a couple of minutes ago there. You said that the U.S. was on track to, did you say double their industrial footprint in five years? Did I hear that right? You know, you heard it right. The Chinese system is breaking down for a number of internal and external issues of part demographics. Uh, they're the fastest aging society in human history. And they're now admitting that they overcounted their population by in excess of 100 million people aged 40 and under. So it is already a country in advanced demographic collapse. And this is China's last decade period. Whether or not it collapses sooner is an issue of management and Ukraine war stuff. And none of that looks particularly good. So we're looking at losing Chinese manufacturing in total and German manufacturing in near total more or less at the same time. So our choice is double our industrial plant or go without stuff. Americans love their stuff. The $100 trillion question, therefore, in against this backdrop where you see your world economy is, is doomed in nearly, it seems like, every direction. Where, where are you putting your money? Well, 
I am not a CFA, so let's start with that. <laughs> uh, but it, before the Ukraine war, all of my stuff was in long-term plays. So I look for firms where their supply chain is within the United States, where the product is energy intensive in its production, courtesy of the shale revolution, we have the cheapest energy and electricity in the world, where demand for the product is driven by demographics, and the U.S. has the best demographic structure in the advanced world, and Mexico with the best in the world, period. And if it was exportable as well, that was kind of the trifecta. So I really like food processing. I really like energy processing and petrochemicals. Now, since the war has started, and I'm in time anticipating most of the Russian output to just fall off the market completely, I've also gotten very big into commodities. But you've got to be really careful in that space because most internationally traded commodities players are truly global. And so consider agriculture. If you want to get into ag, your, your default is to go with the big four, you know, ADM, Bungie, that crowd. But their biggest assets are in Russia and Ukraine, and they're going to lose all of them. So I don't want exposure to that. You, you have to look at actually where the players are exposed in addition to what they're making. We're not used to thinking of geography when we're making investment decisions, and we're going to have to develop that habit very quickly. So we're down to our, our final question today. It's a two-parter. So what was your first job in the industry, Peter? And if you could go back and take yourself for coffee on your first day, what key piece of advice would you offer yourself? Well, remember, I'm not in finance. <laughs> so my, my first big boy job uh, was when I interned with the State Department in Australia. And I had a great time, but I knew one month in that this was not for me. I was never going to be a good bureaucrat. So my advice would have probably been to go back before that and tell my younger self to learn Spanish because it's the number two language of the United States. It's the number one language of our primary trading partner. And over the course of the next 20 years, it's the fact that it's the number one language of the entirety of the Western Hemisphere is going to prove very, very useful. If you had an MBA and you were fluent in Spanish, there's a lot that you can do. Hell, I've been speaking today with global geopolitical strategist and big boy author, Peter <laughs> Zion. Thanks so much for coming on the show today, Peter. It's been a real pleasure. Not a problem. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and this is me. Guiding assets. <laughs>